Thank you. Oh, okay. okay. Amen. Amen. Good to be back and good to see everyone. Okay, and one thing I enjoy about um, coming here is each time I visit, I see changes. All right. Now, and you know, uh, there is a lot of wisdom also because I what I see in uh, the wisdom in uh, applying those changes is that so many times uh, we we get excited and then we want to do big, you know, big things, big projects, and whatever. But one thing I've always uh, appreciated about this church is that each time I come back, I see the week to week small improvements. All right, and you may not think that very much is going on, but when someone like me comes back a year later, I see that actually there's a lot of progress. All right, and um, and sometimes you need to be away for a while before you actually realize that, that this is actually what's going on. And I thank God for that spirit, right? Constant improvements and, and there's a heart to improve and change things because as you know, in the majority of Baptist churches, the doctrine of uh, the perpetual church, right? Nothing changes. We're not supposed to. It's never been done before. We're not supposed to f change all that. And um, I, I appreciate the spirit because um, things change also because there's growth, right? And only living things grow. You notice that? All right, parents, you know that, right? 101 as a parent, all right? Only living things grow. And, and so change is inevitable, but the uh, right kind of change, biblical, uh, you know, biblically grounded change, is what we want to see. All right, this morning, we're going to be in a few places. We'll be in New Testament. We're also going to be in the Old Testament. So let's start off with uh, this, right? Uh, let's turn to First Peter chapter 3. And then since we are going to have a wedding today, I'm just going to lay some thoughts here. But then connected to that, I will want to talk about decision making because all of us have decisions in our lives and, and choices that we have to make. And... More so with Cedric and Millie because uh, they are about to make one of the most, uh, one of the biggest, the sec, probably the second most important decision, uh, third most important decision in their lives. First one being being saved, right, and then allowing the Lord to do a work of sanctification in our lives. That's number two, right? That decision to dedicate our lives for for His use, for His glory, and then the third thing will be. Uh, marriage because this is the one decision where you can really mess up your life right it's either going to be the biggest blessing or the worst thing you ever did right and many times only by God's grace so let's turn to first Peter chapter 3 and we'll start from there and uh, let's do this let's all stand and uh, we'll read this responsively. I'll read the first verse, you read the next verse, and we'll do um, okay, the first seven verses. Okay, beginning verse, uh, verse 1. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they, may, they also may without the word be warned by the conversation of the wives. Whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating of the hair and of, of the wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel. But let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, given the ornament of a meeting and quiet of spirit, which is in the sight of God. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands. Right together, likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. All right, may God bless us the reading of His word. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the, uh, bringing us here this morning that we can be found even faithful in thy house. And we, uh, even on the day where there are so many other things that uh, we have to do and the preparations, even for a wedding. And yet, Lord, I thank Thee for um, even the 
resolve to put you first, to put you in first place and first priority in our lives, uh, in spite of all the busyness of life, and Lord, that we can be here. Help us, Lord, to make good use of this time, even as we attend to the uh, teaching and the preaching of your word. Open our understanding. I pray for your Holy, that the Holy Spirit, Lord, will just uh, illuminate the scriptures, and Lord, your thy Spirit also will empower me, Lord, that I will be able to teach and preach Lord, with the power of God and not with the power of man. And uh, Lord, um, just take away all distractions, and I pray that our hearts will be tender and open even to your truth. And so, Father, we thank thee. We, we just commit this time to you in Christ's name. We pray. Amen. Please be seated. All right. Now, I'm just going to begin with some thoughts here, but I'm going to connect to actually what I wanted to deal with. But in the end, it's all connected. All right. Now, and okay, I, I'm just trying to get used to this mic because it's a bit more sensitive than the one that I'm, I, my, the hit one mic that I used back in Singapore. All right. But, um, this is the, I get the more robust, stronger one in case we want to you know, do the aerobics and all, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> all right, but uh, you know, it's funny because it, it works for that and for people who are dancing, but also for pastors because you have a fixed distance and you keep the same sound level. So, but anyway, it turns out they have different models. Okay, now anyway, we're, we're in First Peter chapter 3. Now, Peter l lays out instructions to husbands and wives. But we have read seven verses here, and I think you will notice that there seem to be more instructions given to the wife than to the husband. All right? Now, that's because it's not because Peter is picking on the, hus uh, on the wives, all right, that, oh, you, you're bad, you know, you're no good, whatever. But what I want us to realize this morning as we look at these seven verses is that there are many things that a wife can do to change a situation. All right? And that this was written for them to realize that there is much in the power in the hands, all right, much power in the hands of a godly wife. All right? A woman of faith, if only she would trust the Lord instead of trusting in her own devices. All right? And so the thing is, all of us, whether you're single or whether you're married, we have decisions and we have problems that we have to face. Okay? You get married, you have double the problems. Okay? But you're not dealing with it alone anymore. All right? And that's a great blessing. Now, but here I found a lot of encouragement when I uh, study these verses because it points out one thing that a lot of times women solve these problems the wrong way. Okay? Hear me carefully. They, solve, they try to solve the problem the wrong way. And because of that, you, instead of things improving, it gets worse. Okay? Now, men are not immune to that, that which is why later on we're, we're going to cross over to Genesis to, okay, to deal with this. Now, it says, though, likewise, in other words, there was a whole bunch of other instructions given in chapter 2 and chapter 1. All right, but it says, Likewise, ye wives. Now it says, Be in subjection to your own husbands. Submit to them. Okay, there is a voluntary choice, and men, do not use this to force them to submit to you. That's not your job. Your job in Ephesians chapter 5 is very clear. You love your wives. Right? And then to be, not to be bitter against them. Okay? It is not your job to make them submit. Okay, now, there was one, I think, old, older uh, translation. Uh, I can't remember what was of the King James of the... No, 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 it's not the King James. They were the earlier English translations. It was known as the Wife Beater's Manual, uh, Bible. Why? Because the commentary next to this passage says, and if she doth not obey her husband, the hu he endeavoured to beat her over the head with a pen until she submit. <laughs> okay, do you see why it's dangerous to read the commentary and then read the text? You study and read the text. Now, here it says, it's a voluntary decision. Is it be in subjection to who? Not to somebody else's husband, your own husband. All right? I say this because there are Baptist churches that teach that all women must submit to all the men. It says to your own husband, 
Right? It says that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. Now, this is a very common problem or situation that you're going to find. Is that the sooner that you marry a, a man and you're going to find that there are going to be times that he is stubborn, he is willful, and worse, he's not walking in obedience to the Lord. It's going to happen. All right, it's going to happen. It happen. It, that's me. It happened to me a few times. I'm pretty sure it happened with Pastor Joel also. But here, this verse tells us there is a solution. All right, that if any obey not the word, now it can include two types of people. One, those who are saved and who are not in obedience to the word of God. They may not always. Now, we, none of us are perfect, so we aren't always uh, walking perfectly. But there is also the possibility, what if you are married to someone who's not saved? But it's very interesting because it tells us here that they may, says, without the word. That means outside of the word. Now, because if someone's not obeying, obeying the word of God, how are you going to deal with this? Now, it says, uh, it says without the word, it says, be warned. How? By the conversation of the wise. By your godly living by your godly attitude okay the thing we need to understand of course is what is that godly attitude what is that godly conversation now it says while they behold your chase right Com conversation coupled with fear now this okay now this chase conversation now it's talking about your this spiritual very holy uh, way of living and but it says, combined with what? Fear, a reverence for your husband. Okay, this is not fear as in a horror movie. Fear that he might beat you on the head with a pen, as the, the old commentator had said. But it has the reverence. Men, you will see that reverence in her when you examine how uh, does she reverence the Lord, right? Uh, how, how does she reverence the word of God and, you know, how does she reverence her father? What's her relationship with her father like? Okay, these are things to consider before you are married. But here, it says, now, in, in doing so, all right, this is what will win the heart of that man even when he is not right. Okay, now, let's pop there for a while and think because many times, what happens, ladies? We feel that, but, but, but I need to do something. All right? And they, one of the things, one of the devices they use, they will nag. Can I get, share a secret? For men, it doesn't work. Yeah. Really doesn't work. Aside from having him in response push you further away, it's not going to work. Okay? A man can be deaf voluntarily. <laughs> Seriously. It was, the old days was when reading the newspaper, he's deaf. You know, he's, now today he's reading his phone or his iPad or whatever. And he can be deaf. But... And the, the, the thing, what was that the thing on Facebook? It says, you know, there's no need to tell a, nag a man and tell him what he needs to do every six months. <laughs> okay, but the thing is, this, nagging was one. Now, it, it wore, um, the other thing was what? Emotional manipulation. Crying and tears. Oh, you don't love me. Oh, oh, oh. And for seven days, for seven days, Samson's wedding. His wife did that every day. He said, you won't tell me the answer to the riddle. Oh, you don't love you. And he finally, he, she wore him down. Okay, he told her the answer. She gave it to the Philistines. He walked out on her. Never came back. Okay, now, women have all sorts of devices. Sometimes they will try to use deceit to manipulate and whatever to get what they want. 
All right, Delilah d attempted to do that with Samson. Okay, a woman has many weapons, but you have to realize the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but spiritual. And here, what we see is that your godly attitude and your godly submission is what the Lord is going to use. Okay, but you are the instrument. You contrast that to the next few verses because it says, whose adorning, let it not be the outward adorning or plating of the hair, right? You, you, women sometimes spend a lot of time to get the hair fixed and whatever, and I know you're going to do that today, right? Everyone's going to try to look beautiful, right? The plating of the hair it says of the wearing of gold and putting on of apparel, okay? Now, it doesn't mean that a godly woman doesn't wear clothes. She does, okay? But... The emphasis is not on the outside and all the decorations, whoever. Okay? And I have to say this because uh, sometimes they come, some women think that, uh, you know, in order to come across as beautiful and attractive, they come dressed looking like a Christmas tree. <laughs> okay? And. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just, I have this sudden recall of uh, one missionary's wife, but I won't, I won't mention names. Okay, it's dressed as a, like a Christmas tree. Now, it says it's not all these things, all, right? all these outward things, but it says, but let it, verse 4, be the hidden man of the heart. Okay, because that person, the inside, now how do, how do we see the, now is it possible to see the hidden man of the heart? It's on the inside, right? Because this is verse 3. It's all the outward appearance. The, it's very obvious. All right? We can see all those things. And then these days with all the cosmetics and whatever, boom, it hits you in the eye. All right? But here, just let it be of the hidden man of the heart. Now, is this in that which is not corruptible? Guess what? It's not going to change with age. Right? Ladies, we can feed millions of people all around the world with the money that is spent on all the skincare products that will make you, guarantee, will make you 20 years younger. All right? A lot of money is spent on that. Now, these days, men are also spending money on that. And we could feed the hungry millions around the world with that, that money that's spent every year. But it says here, okay, which is not corruptible, Aging will not erase the beautiful woman that's inside. Okay, one preacher said it, said it this way. Yes, age can rob my wife of her hair and the skin, the beauty, the outward beauty. I said it will never take away the joyful smile that's, that comes from the inside. And, now, it says here, even the ornament, now this is a decoration, right? It is actually something that's visible, can be seen, of a meek and quiet spirit, okay, which is in the sight of God of great price. Now, this meek and quiet spirit, now, what is meekness? Moses was described as the meekest man in all the earth, okay? Meekness is when we are calm. That the circumstances that are changing around us, that the trouble that we is around us, and all these things, it doesn't change us. We stay firm. We and we will come, and it, we don't get overly excited. We don't overreact. Okay, and then this is meek and a quiet spirit. Why? Because a lot of times. You will know because there is no quiet spirit because there is a demand. I say, I need to take control of the situation. We need to do something and I need to fix that husband. He's not walking right. And so, it says here, that's not how you're going to deal with this. Okay, years back, um, it happened with a friend of mine, uh, sadly, because uh, he got married to somebody and then they were... They loved each other so much that every time they're together, they're fighting like cats and dogs. Okay? 
And then after that, ah, okay, I can't stand you. We'll, we'll be apart for two weeks. The moment they see each other, oh, 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 I love, love you. And then within five minutes, they're fighting again. And that was going on over, over and over again. Now, now she said one thing. She said she wanted the pastors, the elders in the church to come for count, to, to put them, bring them into counseling. Then she explained the reason why. I said, so that they can tell him what to do and fix this guy because it's not her problem, it's his problem when it's actually both of them. Okay, sadly, they're not together anymore. But I want us to see here, this, this meek and quiet spirit is an ornament that can be seen. Now, I like the last part of this verse because it says, which is in the sight of God of great price. Think about this. In the sight of God, God can see that in you. Alright? And by the way, if God can see that in you, it cannot be faked. You can pretend. It is not a mask. A lot of times people will wear a mask in church. Right? Men or women. And sometimes it's a mask of spirituality. Oh, I'm, you know, I'm like this, I'm like this. But the insight is a bit different. Here, God, imagine he has x-ray vision and he go pierces through all that and now he sees the true self. But he says this is an ornament. It's decorative, it's beautiful, it's attractive, right? And it's valuable or great price. Men, what's that got to do with us? Do you realize the nearer to God we are, the closer we walk with him and we have a heart, you know, just like David, as we become a man after God's own heart, you will see what God can see in that person. You're going to realize that, wow, you know, who, that lady sitting over there, whoever, is like, wow, how come I never noticed this before? Years back, my wife and I, when we were in uh, our church in California, now there were two ladies in particular, uh, there were actually three ladies in particular that stood out. And uh, I would notice them on Sundays. Two of them don't even have teeth. They were in their 70s, maybe almost 80s, but they were, they were so joyful whenever we met, you know, my wife and I. And, and I could s also notice there was something inside, that spirituality. Another one was a deacon's wife, and she's a grandmother. But again, there was a certain spirit that I, I came to appreciate. It's not on the outside. Okay, now the right man, one who is close to God, he can see that, right? Because just like the, the Lord who can see this in the sight of God, this is of great price. This man will be able to see that. Now, but let's get back, get down to the action because decisions have to be made, right? Verse five tells us, for after this manner, it was in this manner, in the old time, the holy women also. Now notice this, who trusted in God, right? Adorned themselves. They, this was what they put on, not the makeup or the hair or the jewelry and the accessories and, you know, and the bright clothing. But it says they adorned themselves with this hidden man of the heart. Holy women. How? Being in subjection unto their own husbands. Again, this is a voluntary surrender of their will. And I, like I said, it is not the husband's job to make her do that. It is her responsibility before the Lord to choose to do so. Husband, what if your wife is not going to submit? Very simple. Are you submitting to the Lord? Are you surrendered to him? Because if you're surrendered to him, the next thing we'll do is we'll love our wives. All right? As we love our wives and we're submitted to him, the Lord will know how to deal with her about this. Okay? And I'll say this for the, for the men and for Cedric's uh, benefit. My wife stopped wrestling and fighting with me over decisions 
the day she started to see that I had okay, completely but not perfectly given myself to the will of God as she saw that you know, even though I made mistakes she was willing to trust and to follow even when we made, I made mistakes the difference was this she knew, she could see it's no longer about my will but his will it was, it was really very simple I wish I knew that a long time ago it was really that simple and she could see that All right, that in both cases the husband and wife in their submission to the Lord wife, we are willing to do the right thing and I did that she no longer questioned the decisions and whatever we had a lot of disagreements before and I was stubborn okay stubborn foolish young man who wanted my way and many times yes with good intentions good intentions don't mean anything okay I still fell flat on my face and it hurt my wife okay but once I settled on that I had no problems with her I didn't have to make her follow okay and it's been that way especially for the last now uh, about 20 years okay now here it tells us it gives us an example in verse 6 even as Sarah obeyed Abraham right to what extent she remember she deeply respected him she reverenced him right there was a godly fear just calling him Lord now it says whose daughters ye are as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement she called him Lord right she was willing to follow him and to obey him now but when you study the life of Abraham you're going to realize Abraham didn't always make the right decision okay and realize this that even in a, okay in the marriage and for Cedric and Emily the thing is as you start off you are going to have to make those choices and decisions and figure things out and you're going to make mistakes along the way and that will eventually become the pool of experience and wisdom that you're going to gain over the years okay now but it tells us here that Sarah obeyed Abraham and she called him Lord now it says whose daughters ye are the, the idea here is what follow her example be like Sarah alright and it says as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement now one of the problems that the, the wife especially will face is when she is fearful of what the husband may be doing alright and he has a habit for instance of making very impulsive rash decisions whoever and sometimes he doesn't tell her about it until it's done she's terrified okay she's afraid and she's terrified which is what this verse is talking about it should not be with that kind of terror okay and over the years I, in counseling with, with uh, couples and I've seen this problem over and over again that the husband likes to make decisions but is in the habit of making very foolish decisions and he has a terrible track record and what happens is many cases oh, and then after a while maybe because it's, it's messed up a number of times he decides oh, I'm not going to make any more decisions swings to the other extreme and the wife feels that she needs to put on and wear the pants in the house and to take the lead and they struggle with that okay sometimes they do it secretly because why if they don't nothing is going to move forward for the family and things get stuck now we see that Sarah was mentioned as an example so let's do this let's turn all right let's turn over to Genesis and we're going to look at a couple of examples all right I will see I'm, I'm going to speed up a bit all right and we'll look at some of these examples 
to look at Abraham and Sarah because it's important for us to realize, right? Abraham and Sarah, as much as they are a giant in the faith, we must realize that they are no different from you and I. They are a work in progress. All right, and, and, and with the beginning with Abraham, what happens? They were taking baby steps, right? Which you and I know along the way, we fall flat on our faces, but we recover and we move on again, all right? Now, look at Ab uh, Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12, look at verse 1. All right, this is the call of God on Abraham in his life. Now the Lord had said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. He says, And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curse thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now here was the promise of God that this would happen, and he there was a call for Abraham to get out of his own country, to separate himself, to leave everything behind, and then to move to this place. Now, this is a very major decision, don't you think? All right? Men, you know how difficult this is? Imagine you go to your wife and say, Honey, Lord spoke to me. Okay, that's great. Uh, what did he say? He told me to leave. Where are we going? I don't know. How far are we going? I don't know. Where are we supposed to go to? Honey, I don't know. All I know is he told us to keep going and when it's time to stop, he'll tell us. Abraham, are you mad? You got to be crazy. We're going to take everything with us, sell the rest of the things, all right, say goodbye to the, my par our parents and, and uh, the in-laws and all that, our friends and whatever, and we're going to go to nobody knows where. You got to be crazy. But God has to be obeyed. Right? He has to be obeyed. No choice. I say that because that was exactly what happened in 2001. When I surrendered, all I knew was this. The Lord had called me to be a pastor. Where? Which country? I don't know. I had to seek the answer out. How are we going to do that? No idea. All I know is that we had to surrender and, and we, we, when my wife and I boarded the plane, we knew both of us would be unemployed. How are you going to do this when you have no money? I don't know. All I know is I have only one thing that I must do is I have to obey. And my wife went along with that. Okay? Now, sometimes... Now we're told to trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Right? Lean not unto thine own understanding. Alright? In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall give thee the right desires of thy heart. Now the thing is this. There are times that we are called upon to do things and we have no idea what how it's going to be done, only that what needs to be done. How to get there, we have no idea. But you see, the, the, and I, I believe one of the reasons why the Lord doesn't give us a lot many details is He wants to know, will you follow, will you obey, or you want to be in control? Okay, because this happens with our kids all the time. Okay, when my kids were younger, they, they know this. Now they're, they're kind of older, they're all teenagers now, they, they all know this already. They will ask, Dad, where are we going? All right, we're traveling, uh, we're going somewhere, we're driving or something. Where are we going? I said, what do you need to know? You will know when we get there. Okay? I, I, I can't play this game with them. I said, you know when you get there. Secondly, if I tell you now and you don't like it, does that mean you will get out of the car and you walk home? All right. Um, 
do you think I'm going to bring you to the worst possible place on the planet and just so that we could waste a whole afternoon? And my message to them was simply, don't you think you can trust mom and dad? All right? The question for us many times in, in when we face choices and decisions is, are you willing to trust him? Or do you want to be in control? Because many times we want to be in control, although we will not admit it, is that I want to know, okay, what is step one, what is step two, what is step three? Because deep down, I think I can veto this. You see, his, his choice, his plan for you and I is not a suggestion. I, I would like to just pick the parts that I like. No, it doesn't work that way. All right, because here, he, Abraham was given a, a, a call and he was told to go to a specific place. Now realize, if he stopped short of that, he's not going to arrive. All right, because if you read carefully, it is also... All right, because you're going to see that the call of God and the blessing of God had to do with also him being where he needs to be. Okay? I'll give you another example. Remember Elijah? When God called him and told him, get thee to this brook, get Cherif, this is before Jordan. He didn't send him to a place that was full of a, you know, a big sufficient supply of water. He sent him to a tiny brook where for the rest of the famine, he's going to see the level of water go down and down and down. Realize that there are times the Lord, he, he promises to provide for us, to feed us, to provide for us. He doesn't do it by giving you and I a, such a big bank account that you never have to trust him again. You never have to attend a single prayer meeting. You never have to ask for your, and pray and ask for your daily bread. No, he, that, he doesn't work it that way. He, every step of the way is what? For us to increase in our dependence on him. That's why prayer meetings are important. That's why we pray, because it is dependence on God. All right, not independence from him. You see, so many times we want to be like a cell phone. All right, charge up the battery and then after that we, we will be on our way. We don't need him anymore for the rest of the week. That's not how it works. Okay, the, the whole seven days a week, 24 hours is on, we are on a, what they call now, a landline, a wired phone connected to him because we need him all the time. That's why we sing what? I need thee every hour, right? All the time. He doesn't know anything. Abraham, all he knows is he needs to go. Now he departed, he left, whoever, and along the way, I don't have time to go, to go through this whole life of Abraham thing. That's a whole church camp, if you ask me. You know. But he took a detour, actually, because of his father. Out of God's will. He actually time, he did the time out, stopped there, and then finally, he only moved on when, after his father died. Okay, but now let's move on because he goes over to, okay, into this, the, the, the land. Look at verse 7 onwards. And the Lord appeared unto Abraham and said, Unto thy seed will I give, thee, uh, give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. I, one very quick observation here is, you know, as soon as Abraham settled in the place, he settled on his place of worship. So many people, they will leave, a, leave home, they will go to a foreign country to take a job, but they don't even know if there's a church there. Yeah. This was a priority for Abraham, how he would worship the Lord. All right, and then it says, and he removed from thence onto a mountain onto the, on the east of Bethel, pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and high on the east, and there he built it an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. Now, if I remember correctly, because I don't have my notes with me, the name is significant because it talks about, I, I think it means the house of the Lord. Bethel. All right? House of the Lord. And Abraham journey going on still toward the south. Now, notice verse 10. Now, this is this, I believe this is one of the situations that Peter was talking about concerning Abraham and his wife. 
It says, and there was a famine in the land, verse 10, and Abraham went down into Egypt to sojourn there. Notice that next word. And if you, if you have a habit of marking your Bible, circle that. For the famine was grievous in the land. Now, why did he go down into Egypt? Right, because up to that point, he knew where he was supposed to be. God had made it very clear. He told him to stop. He settled in. He even built a place of worship and all that. And he was in the land and wherever he was, that whole area, it was his. For him, his descendants, for generations to come. But verse 10, something happened because the circumstances change. Now, understand this. One mistake that many Christians make is that when the circumstances change, we assume that the will of God has changed. And that's not true. Because God can take care of you and I, wherever you and I may be, even if the circumstances are bad for everyone. And here, it says, there was a famine, and so he made a decision to go down to Egypt. Now, that word for becomes important because it means because the famine was grievous in the land. It's hard times. These days, in our modern world, it may not be a famine where the crops fail. It's that the economy is failing or has slowed down. As the politicians like to say, sometimes it goes into negative growth. Right? Right? And if it happens in a particular country, you'll see sometimes people will migrate and they'll leave and they'll go to another country. All right? They might come home back to the Philippines. But, and so, before we judge Abraham too harshly, realize that we are all capable of making that same kind of decision. All right? Now, he, so it tells us it was very grievous. It was very bad. But again, we have to question the reasoning and the assumption because as long as the presence of the Lord is there, why are we going somewhere else? All right? If we're rooted and planted right in a place where we are prospering spiritually, why go somewhere else? just because the circumstances have changed. The material circumstances have changed. But, the, now, but this is where we come into a, a, a principle. Now, the, there is the logic of faith that we must consider. Why do I say logic of faith? Okay, God promised and called him and said, you go there, you stay there. This is my place for you. All right? So, so there are hard times, there's difficult circumstances, all these things come in. Logic of faith dictates, if God said so, all right, and he has given no other instruction and, and it has not changed, then I should remain where I am because he already promised that's the place that he will prosper us. That's the place that he wants us to be. Lord, the logic of faith will dictate if it is a difficult time, it is then therefore God's will that we go through that that period with his help, with his grace, right, instead of moving somewhere else. So what happened was this. Now Abraham, I believe, knew that this was not the right decision. Because verse 11 onwards, you notice, he moved from a place and a position of faith to fear. Okay, from faith to fear. And in, in, throughout the Bible, you're going to see over and over again that where there is fear, there is unbelief. Whenever the disciples were fearful, Jesus rebuked them for their unbelief. Like for instance, when they were in the storm and in the ship, he rebuked them for their unbelief. Now, here it says, And it came to pass in verse 11, when he was come near to enter into Egypt, that he said unto Sarah his wife, Behold now, I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. Therefore it shall come to pass, when the Egyptians shall see thee, that they shall say, This is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will save thee alive. Now he knew that before he ent they went in. He had this conversation with her before they entered into Egypt. 
In other words, I put it to you, he knowingly, with his eyes open, already knew this was not actually a good decision. It was a compromised decision. He went ahead with it. Now, if you connect this to 1 Peter chapter 3, you're going to see Sarah in acknowledging him, her husband, as Lord. What did she do? Nag him every night about the, the, the move to Egypt? Fought with him? All right? Complained about him to the pastor? No. Okay, now she maintained a godly submission to him. But uh, if you read the rest of this chapter, you'll know one thing. It was the Lord that stepped in to force them out of Egypt again. Right? That's why we talked about how the holy women of old who trusted in God. Okay? Not in the husband who trusted in God but submitted and were in subjection to their own husbands. Why? You and I need to get to where we, we understand that God is more than able to deal with that husband even when he is not right with God than to trust in your own ability and power to deal with him. Okay. We laugh about this uh, back, back home because one of our, one of our sisters um, before she and her husband got saved she married this man because he's he has a meek and quiet spirit okay it's a very quiet man she believed that because of that she could he's easy to manage and control fast forward some years later they got both of them got saved and now she's saying, you know, I am amazed at the wisdom that God gives to this man. He is not that, you know, how some will see oh, this big, dynamic, charismatic leader or whatever, but it says when he speaks, she can, she can see the God-given wisdom. And she submits and respects him even more. Okay, where before she thought, ah, this guy easy, I, I can wrap him around my finger, okay, you know, I can control him. But what happened was this, because after he got saved, he gave his heart to the Lord. The Lord was the one directing him. All right? And in seeing that, what happens, she, instead of trying to rule over him, she was like, I need to follow this man. Okay, now this, this was something volunteered by this sister and she, and she testified to this. Now, Abraham knew that this was a bad decision and uh, he decided he would take precautions. But it's very arrogant and foolish of us to believe that, okay, it's a bad decision, whatever, but you know, we can put measures in place to mitigate the, this, whole, this whole problem. We can minimize the damage and, and the problems arising from this. And that's very foolish. And so when you... And just as he predicted, when they went there, what happened? And it came to pass that when Abraham was coming to Egypt, the Egyptians beheld the woman that she was very fair. Okay? Sarah was a, outwardly a very attractive woman. And even as, she was, as she, even as she was older, even, she still looked fantastic. Right, the princes of Pharaoh saw her. They, they made a recommendation to Pharaoh. She was taken into Pharaoh's house. And guess what? Abraham benefited from the whole thing because verse 16, he says, And he entreated Abraham well for her sake, and she, he had sheep and oxen, and he asses and men servants and maid servants and she asses and ca camels, and wow. You know, you, you realize one thing to, to observe here is that don't make the mistake of assuming just because there are material blessings that it is the right choice. Okay, because I know a lot of churches do that now. Oh, we're with this, with this, with this. Therefore, it must be because God is blessing our ministry. All right. And here, what happened was the Lord dealt with this and the Lord plagued 
Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abraham's wife. Now, who fixed the situation? The Lord did. Alright? The Lord was the one. Not only that, do you know, the, can you imagine what happens in the next few verses? Pharaoh called Abraham and said, What is this that thou hast done unto me? And why didst not thou tell me that she was thy wife? Why says, says thou she is my sister? So I might have taken her to, uh, to me to wife. Now therefore behold thy wife and take her and go thy way. You know how shameful it is when unbelievers have to rebuke us. And God used Pharaoh to rebuke Abraham. Why? Okay, because earlier in the chapter, he bowed down at this altar that he, he, that he put together, right, to offer sacrifices to God. Now, in the move to Egypt, he bowed down at the altar of a God that is called, his name is this, pragmatism. And I put it to you today, many of us are guilty of this. Okay? This God of pragmatism, why? Because the fundamental doctrine of pragmatism say, states this, whatever works for me must be right. Okay? And there are many Christians who are that way because why? the rest of it, well, we will obey and follow the word of God, but the number one doctrine is still whatever works for me must be right. Never mind if we ban a few things here and there. Why? Because if there is the reward and if there is the prosperity, there's all these things, it must be correct. That proves it is correct. Now, that is why churches do that. Okay? They are following the God of pragmatism. Israel in the wilderness was also tested in that way. Why? God allowed them to suffer hunger and thirst and you know, as they wandered around for their 40 years. Now, for a reason, he fed them with manna. To, and in Deuteronomy, Moses told them the reason why. He said, to see if they would obey the Lord or not. He allowed all these things to happen because the, one of the f- biggest temptations when the circumstances are not in our favor is we always assume we need to take control. And what do we do? God, who was in the throne, we push him out, we shove him out, and then we say, I'm taking charge from now on. Why? Because I don't like the way you're running things. I'm going to take over. Can I remind everyone, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft? But many times we don't realize that when we bow to pragmatism, we have dethroned God and taken over. Now, Sarah, I think, had a very difficult decision. Does she f- is she going to follow? Because she almost ended up as somebody else's wife. Okay? And if you look at, uh, one more note here, in Egypt, it was a very weird culture. All right, because it seems like the the wicked lifestyle in Egypt was that any man can have any woman and commit fornication, and that was fine. Taking another man's wife, very bad. No, no. Even Pharaoh was like, "Oh, this you almost made me commit a sin." <laughs> okay, and that was the kind of the weird lifestyle that they had, but. Notice that he was sent away. If you look at the next chapter in chapter 13, you're going to see there were certain repercussions because Lot also went down with Abraham into Egypt. He had a taste of that life. And when it was time for them to decide how they would separate out the land before them, Lot chose the plains of Sodom and the cities, uh, city of Sodom because he wanted, he was tempted by that life. There were consequences to this mistake, even though by God's grace they were kicked out from Egypt, right, and, and they returned. Now, I want us to 
Okay, I okay. I'm not going to go there, but I, I I just want to make note of one thing. Okay, when you if you want, you can make a note of this. If you jump to chapter twenty, you're going to see this was not the only time. It happened again, because Abra uh, chapter twenty verse one and Abraham journeyed from thence toward the south country and dwelt between Kadesh and Shur and sojourned in Gera and. Abraham said of Sarah his wife, she is my sister, and Abimelech king of Gerasen and took Sarah. He lied a second time. Okay? And realizes sometimes, sometimes we men are so thick-headed we need to go through the lesson twice. Two times in a row, guess what? When you fast forward to Genesis chapter 26 and verse 6 onwards. You know what happened? His son Isaac had to make the same mistake and had to relearn the lesson. Okay? At least Isaac only had to deal with this lesson one time. Abraham went through it twice before he, he really figured things out. Okay? Now, I want us to realize here that deep down inside we can run into this danger where we are wrestling and fighting God for control because why we don't get what we want okay and then being married is uh, a challenge because now it is not you living as a single and making your own decisions there's somebody else okay but again that's why Peter said the holy women of old, it was they adorned themselves, right, with this godly conversation, with their godly submission to their husband, trusting in God that the Lord will be the one to deal with his heart. Now, uh, it's somewhere in Proverbs, I think it says, it tells us that the heart of a king is in God's hands. Okay, and that could include a pagan king and an ungodly king. But it says, and just as God is able to direct the waters, okay, and the rivers downstream, He can turn this heart any way He wants. If you read through Daniel, you read through Esther, you're going to see that God is able to direct and change that. Just as uh, who a man who okay who does not obey the word, right? In First Peter chapter three, God can direct his heart and change that okay the danger is when we take things into our own hands now turn to turn to chapter 25 and look let's go to verse 19 I, I just want to point out something here because the the cost and the danger of taking things into our own hands can be very costly all right. Verse 19 says, And these are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to wife, the daughter of Bethel, the, uh, the Syrian of Padan Aram, the sister to, okay, to Laban the Syrian. Verse 21, And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife. All right. He was pleading, praying, and begging the Lord. Why? It says, because she was barren. They were unable to have children. And any couple here, if you're unable to have children, however, you will know it is very trying, very painful, and very difficult. Especially when you realize, you thought, okay, I'm young. There's nothing medically wrong with us. You should be able to just have children. But so many times in the scriptures, you're going to see that we're told it is the Lord that will open or close the womb. And one of the times, aside from difficult circumstances, like a famine or whatever, one of the times that you're going to find that you and I are driven to our knees in our dependence is when control is taken away from us. Like in this case, 
being unable to have children. Right? I know because it was about nine years. It was only in the ninth year of marriage that my our firstborn, right, our daughter Amy, was born. It took nine years. Okay, the first few years, I was arrogant, foolish, and I thought, okay, and I I did not have the benefit of strong biblical teaching on on this. I thought, I I said this, and my wife parroted this same line. I'm not ready. I don't know. Maybe some someone here is thinking that way. I said I'm not ready. When we decided we were ready and we wanted to do this, nothing happened. To make it worse, the doctors revealed to us there's nothing wrong with you at all, with both of us, perfectly fine, but nothing for years. Okay. Now. We have to understand he is in control, and and what happened was this, all right? Isaac, in that situation, he turned to the Lord. He entreated the Lord for his wife's sake, because she was barren. And notice, and the Lord was entreated of him. In other words, the Lord heard Isaac, right? And Rebecca, his wife, conceived. Answered prayer. Notice the dependence on the Lord. Not on, oh, we need to try this, to try that, and we'll figure something out. All right? Now, Isaac understood this probably also because he grew up with mom and dad telling him how he was conceived and how mom and dad made the mistake of trying to figure things out on their own. Right? They took things into their own hands and they created a big mess. All right? Why? Because as spiritual as... Abraham and Sarah were, they were a work in progress, just like you and I. They had to grow, they had to make mistakes, and you know, there were some serious consequences to those decisions. But you notice, it, it didn't stop there, because the next thing, after she conceived, verse 22, and the children struggled together within her, and she said, if it be so, why am I thus? Right? If it is the will of God, it is, if it's his plan that she will have children, why is she going through this? There's a struggle inside. Can you imagine uh, there's a lot of kicking and all, all that going on? And so what did she do? And she went to inquire of the Lord. Amen. Yeah. All right? And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and the and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. Right? She's having twins, but I said they are very different in character. It says, the two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels, and the one shall be stronger than the other. And then God gives a prophecy, and the elder shall serve the younger. God's plan. The elder shall serve the younger. Right now, they are twins. They're going to be, the elder is going to be older by, I don't know, one minute. Okay, 30 seconds. But you know something? Verse 27, and the boys grew. And Esau was a cunning hunter, a very skillful hunter, a man of the field. He's an outdoors guy, rugged man. All right, and then elsewhere, I think, hairy man. So, real manly guy. And Jacob was a plain man, living, dwelling in tents. He is a bit of a home, homebound kind of guy, all right? In fact, we see he loves cooking. And Jacob sought pottage, verse 29. Oh, sorry, sorry, verse 28. Notice how there was a family problem. And Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison, but Rebekah loved Jacob. This was a divided home. Okay? 
And it's very painful if you live in one of them, okay? Uh, those of you who have siblings, brothers, sisters, whoever, you're always being compared one to another, all right? And mom may prefer one, dad may prefer another, whatever. And they made the mistake of dividing their own home in picking their favorites, all right? But I want to see this next few verses. And Jacob sought pottage, and Esau came from the field, and he was faint, all right? Esau came back from hunting. He was hungry. He was almost to the point of fainting. And Esau said, unto, said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom, right? It was red. Okay. So what did he do? Well, Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. Now Jacob, now both of them know this. God had already made it very clear, the older will serve the younger. But when Jacob said this, now he says, well, sell me the, your birthright, I'll, I'll feed you. Notice this. Up to that point in time, the elder serving the younger has not happened yet. Jacob seized on the opportunity to make it happen. He says, sell me your birthright. Can I say this? God does not need your help. He only needs your obedience and your submission. Because this very act of doing this, right, would create a lot of problems. Now, mom and dad picking their favorites already planted the seeds of this problem. Can I say this? All of them were acting in disobedience to what God had laid out, right? The elder will serve the younger. Dad did not like it. Esau was not happy about that, right? And then Jacob decided, well, if that's the case, I'm going to have to do something to make it happen. And so, look at the, his re, look at the reply because verse thirty two and Esau said, "Behold, I am at the point to die, and what profit shall this birthright do to me?" And Jacob said, swear to me this day, and he swore unto him, and he sold his birthright unto Jacob. All right? Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus, now notice this conclusion from, from God. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Right? Why? Because in the now bitterness is a very dangerous thing to harbor the hole in your heart. It can come because you don't like a situation, you believe that you may be on the receiving end of injustice, right? some injustice was done to you in your life, whatever. Now, maybe something is unfair, I need to set that right, I need to fix this, I need to turn that around. Now, there are many types of responses to this. One, we may decide that we'll seize control to set things right. In Esau's case, you know what, his response was this, I'm going to serve the younger. I'm going to give up my position of leadership. You know what, this birthright is worthless to me. worth nothing more than a bowl of soup and some bread. And the danger for us is that we can come to where we actually sell off or give up something long term that is very precious in exchange for something that will appeal to our flesh just for that brief moment. Sometimes someone may give up their purity in a fit of anger. We may make a decision that gives up a whole wonderful future that the Lord has for us to feed that anger or that frustration. Okay. To him, that birthright, it's something very, very precious from the Lord. And that birthright as the firstborn is a double share 
whatever, okay, whatever Jacob will receive, Esau gets double. Just cast that aside, like use tissue paper. Why? Because he didn't like what God's plan was for him. Jacob, on the other hand, yes, he liked God's plan. But he decided, I'm going to take things into my own hands to make it happen. Now, I think there is a common thing here that we see that at the end of the day, both were not leaning on the Lord or trusting in Him. And the constant temptation is there that I need to take control. Right? Whether it's in, you see, in every one of these, there were decisions that were made. Now, all of us will have, all of us have the freedom to make decisions. But once you've made the decision, that choice now has power over you. Why? Because we have to live with the consequences. Okay? Now, I'm actually not done with 1 Peter chapter 3. So let's go back there and I will just wrap up one verse because we, we still have verse 7 and we'll finish this, right? It says, likewise ye husbands. Now remember, six verses were instructions to the wife and then one verse to the husband. <laughs> Man, the guys have it easy. No, it says, okay, likewise ye husbands. Now it says, dwell with them, referring to the wife, according to knowledge. You have to know her well. You can't do, now, the other thing is this, you, you cannot dwell with them if you are not physically together under one roof. Okay? Pragmatism again dictates many times, well, we do what is necessary because for economic reasons, for income reasons or whatever, and we separate. We're living apart or whatever. And can I say this? If you're living apart, you are separated in your marriage. Period. Right. I'm not being unkind or mean or whatever. This is the reality. And um, now it says here, dwell with them according to knowledge. Now it says, husbands, giving honor unto the wife. How do you give honor to someone? They are your priority. Yes. Husband, they are your priority, not your friends, not your buddies, not your computer game, not your car. She is your priority. When we give someone and we give honor to someone, maybe uh, this is the seat okay, for an honored guest. Now, is this the honor is to be given to your wife? Right? And then it says, as unto the weaker vessel. Ah, oh, yeah, she's weak. No. <laughs> the weaker vessel. Picture this. We. Usually, when we have, like, say, a very priceless, precious vase, we put it into a special place to protect it, to take good care of it, because of the higher value, right? If you have some a plate that is precious and valuable, I don't put dog food and give it to my dog to eat. I use it for very special occasions. Right? It's held into a place of honor. Now, this is, husbands, that's your job. You give honor to her, you dwell with her, you live with her. All right? And you know her. When you know her, you will know her strengths and you will know her weaknesses. Now, many times this is where the problem is for husbands and wives, is that we know their faults you don't know their strengths. How do I know that? Because you don't know how to tap on her strength to complement your weak areas. Yeah. That's why we fight. We fight over the differences. Instead of realizing that the differences, her strengths and my strengths makes us a lot stronger because we are a team. 
We are a team. All right? There are things that my wife can see and she can do that I can't do and I'm, I'm terrible at certain things. I'm glad I have a wife. She fills up all the forms for me. Seriously. I stare at the form and I, my, my brain goes blank. She fills up forms. All right? She d- handles a lot of admin that I... I Okay, secret. If you want to torture me, make me do admin. <laughs> okay, I will go crazy. Now, she loves doing that stuff. But guess what? She needs, she loves having someone who can set the big picture and set the direction or whatever. And that's what I'm good at. So we work as a team. Now, before, What was rubbing against each other? Our differences. Okay? Now, you have to understand, you're not going to fix and deal with any life problems if you cannot function as a team. You will fail. Here, it says, as onto the weaker vessel, but then this last part is amazing. And as being as, what's the next word? Together. Together. As together, we inherit together, it says, the grace of life. God's grace, all right, in other words, God's help is given to us in this life to help us with what, what we need to do every day of our lives. How? To a husband and a wife who are together. Physically, all right, Emotionally, spiritually, and in making decisions. You have to be together. Okay? It is not, well, 50% will go to her, 50% will go to him. No. You either get 100% because you are working together or you get zero. Do you see the danger here? You, if you get zero, it says that your prayers be not hindered. We're still in a prayer meeting, right? We're, your prayers are hindered. We can have petition and prayer requests and whatever, and it's a waste of time because why? Husband and wife, you're not together. You're not on the same page. Like Isaac and, and his wife, Rebecca, both have their own agenda. And they divided their family. And here, life, we can, you and I can make life so much more difficult because why? We're not together. You can make it even more difficult by not being physically together. And yet, so many times we want to fix the problem by, uh, the solve the problem and whatever by, you, well, you, 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 you solve it your own way, I solve it my own way, and you do your thing, I do my thing. You will never get anywhere. Okay? Now, I believe this, there are six verses there to the wife and one to the husband precisely for this, that the one who can make the most difference is the wife. In other words, you are more powerful than you think, but you can create a bigger mess than you can imagine. How you deal with it, you must choose very wisely, right? very spiritually. Okay, because the stakes are high. But it's all here. The heart, the in the hidden man, the inner man. Or as that was what Peter said, right? Uh, in other words, the inner woman inside. Okay? Husbands, you have to know your wife. Uh, understand this. If you're not together, that will include something. I mentioned this, my wife can see things that I cannot see. And if your wife is telling you something, you need to take heed. I don't say, I didn't say you must absolutely obey her in all things. But she, God gave her to you for a reason, and she is able to see, hear, and understand things that you don't understand, just as you can see and hear and understand things that she doesn't understand. That's why you need each other. We make our decisions together in that unity. All right? 
And in that unity, understand this, it takes two. I'm very clear about this, that in the last 20 years especially, um, God gave me one brain and it's not sufficient. I need my wife's. Right? I need her brain. I need her heart. Right? I need her two eyes. She sees things I don't see. And even in church matters, sometimes I, I, I recognize the wisdom. She covers the blind spot that I have. And when she hears something, sometimes for me, I'm, I'm, I'm very sensitive to you know, what people say and I, I, and I understand I can empathize with them and all that. And so my wife is the one sometimes she sees something, she hears something and she says, she cautions me. Okay? And I've learned that it will be very foolish of me to ignore her. Okay? And one of, nothing says, okay, man, nothing says I love you better than the fact that, you know, I regard what you say, I'm listening to what you say, and your input is very valuable to me. Okay? And a lot of this in these verses, it tells us that, that we need, it is not something that on the wedding day you immediately have. It is something that we need to develop the skill to work together. Because either you work together or it will tear you apart. Right? So as we close here, I want to challenge everyone right, that marriage is a wonderful thing provided you know how to build on that and to, you know, to use the strengths of one another. And maybe someone, for someone here today, you need to maybe turn to your husband or turn to your wife and to tell her, you know something? I have not appreciated you enough. Right? And there are things that maybe I have come to disregard you and it has become an area of contention in our marriage and it's hurting you and I'm sorry. Please forgive me. God gave you to me for a reason and to be a help to me as a husband. And ladies, God gave you to be a help to him, not a hindrance to him. Right? But understand the process of change in a husband, that's something God will do if your heart and your submission is right. Okay? Because I tell you this, a lot of unbelievers will know how to do this. Wow. I'm married to him already. He is now mine. Now I'm going to fix him. I'm going to change him, whatever, and it will utterly fail. It doesn't work that way. Okay? If you can't change, if the guy won't change for you before he's married, it's not going to happen after he's married. Guys, do I get an amen? And you know that. You know that is true, right, guys? Okay? It's the ladies that don't understand that. That's why, you see, he must give his heart to the Lord. And you must encourage him to do that. You don't encourage him to give his heart to the Lord by proving how much more spiritual you are compared to him. That's spiritual pride. It's not going to work. It will backfire. I've seen people, men, after the wife tries to do that, they're not in church anymore. I was like, yeah, you're more spiritual. You go, you go to church. I'll do my own thing. All right, so understand this. It's the Lord that's going to do that work. On, the, on that wedding day, two people, they have very little idea what they're in for. Okay? They're far from that outward picture beautiful, radiant, bright, all right, dashing, be handsome, you know, so guapo, you know, the, the, the groom and all that. But understand this, when you look at the biblical picture, that happens at the end. At the end, not on the, at the beginning. Christ took 
unto him a bride that was not beautiful, that was covered with filth, she was not desirable, yet he laid down his life. Husbands, he laid down, he gave his life 100% for someone who was not yet desirable. He was willing to drop everything for her. All right, shed his blood, paid full price, and then by the washing of the word, he cleanses her, and he does his first ministry is not preaching from here. His first ministry is to his wife. That each day that they are together, it says she becomes more beautiful, more radiant, more, more pure. Right? We're not having any spot or wrinkle or any such things. None of those imperfections that on that final day when Christ presents his bride to himself, no one can find a fault in her. Okay? That is also a picture of the journey from the day we start on the wedding day onwards. All right? But that's not going to happen if you don't work together. It says your prayers, even your prayers will be hindered. You can say all you want. It doesn't even get past this roof. Okay? Dwelling together. All right? According to knowledge. Understanding her. Honoring her because she is more important than you. I'm not just giving you my opinion. Christ laid the example. Yeah. That bride was more important than his very own life. Mm. All right? If you cannot put your job or your career or whatever as a lower priority than your wife, you have a problem. Okay, you have a problem. Any guy who cannot put that as second priority to the one that he wishes to marry has a problem. Why? Right? He left Christ left his throne to seek after a bride. That was the priority. Why? Because for you and I in this life, we need the two of us together if we are to be heirs together of the grace of life. The grace of life. We all need the grace of life. All right? We can't do it on our own. We know that. But understand this. We can't, no need can't do it on our own. We can't do it without God's help. We can't do it without our spouse. And we have to pull together. Right? I, firmly, I, I feel a lot of times I don't preach enough about these topics, but I, 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 am firmly, I firmly believe one thing. No church can be strong if the marriages are not strong. But the other way around also works. No marriage can be strong without a strong church teaching all this. It's a mutual dependence. All right? So, as, as we close here, I just want to encourage everyone, maybe there are decisions you have to make. There are some things you have to change in terms of the priority. Maybe you need to make right and f tell each other, you know, I'm sorry. All right? And then get you know, get to the altar and pray together that we will work together by the grace of God. All right? And for the singles, you know, I, I think those qualities and all that tell point you also to the kind of man or woman that we need to be. All right? And maybe someone needs to come up here today and just ask the Lord, do a work, change me, transform me, but I will let you f have full permission to do that and I will step out of the way. Someone here today, maybe you've been trying to take things into your own hands to make certain decisions or whatever, to make things happen when we need to step aside and allow him to make things happen. But let the change begin with me, right? With me first and then the one that God has joined me to in marriage. Okay, will you do that? Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time, for even challenging us through your word. And uh, Lord, I pray that uh, right now, that we will respond to you with our heart. And that there are things that we may have to set right, and uh, things that we may have to say to one another. And uh, Lord, I pray that you give us courage and grace and boldness through your Holy Spirit, that we will endeavor to do what is right, and we will also be resolved that we will want to make the right choices and decisions in seeking your will rather than bowing to the God of pragmatism. And so Father, we just, we just pray you have your way with us, our hearts be tender and responsive to you. And we ask this in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Pastor?
unterwegs. 